what's going on everybody hotep to the family ashe to all my people out there welcome back to another episode of my unapologetic perspective here on the mighty motivation network this is the podcast where we give our point of view of controversial topics from our experience black history and our knowledge as african americans in the words of maya angelou do your best until you know better and when you know better do better so it's important to search for information to discover what you don't know so you can discover your best you. Uh, I am your host, Martre Baker Stevens, and to the right of me is Shaquan Battle. I mean, hello. I decided to come out today, so everybody I'm bald. <laughs> and to the right of him is Jerome Battle. What's up? Um, appreciate everybody that's been tuning in, all the love and support, all the messages. Um, I can't stress enough every episode how how thankful we are for the people who listen, comment, and share their ideas, share their perspective with us. Um, we really appreciate it and we love all of you as this podcast is not to be right. This podcast is to make people think and to spark uh, intellect and conversations to make people research again, like I said in the intro, to discover what you don't know so you can discover your best you. That is the objective of this podcast and also to provide uh, history lessons on things that your kids won't be taught in school, a lot of things that you weren't taught in school. Um, I did post a few statuses of this past week where people commented and messaged me and said, yeah, absolutely. Um, I know our parents taught us this, even though we weren't taught in school. So we have to understand that as parents, as an adult, it's important for us to do our research and, and begin to look for information and begin to, um, not stop educating ourselves. Education doesn't stop K through 12. Education don't stop when you get a degree. Education continues every single day of your life. And that's the way we're going to be able to get our kids to learn because we can see through the Virginia school system, they're not going to teach these things. So instead of, you know, I know we want to protest, I know we want to cause outrage, but what are we doing in the meantime until that happens? It's on us to be able to 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 do the research ourselves and get that kid, give those kids our, the information, or they're going to be in the same predicament that we're in, which is we're learning this stuff at 25, 30 years old. And that's why we have to continue to give our kids this information. For the people who've been following in Bedford, they're they're trying to remove some books from the Bedford school system already. You know, um, a, three of those books happen to be Toni Morrison books. You know, uh, a few of those books have to deal with race and segregation and all of those things. That's because they claim that it has sexual content in it. But we know what the real reason is why they want to remove some of those books. So. This is why we have to read those books and get information so we can begin to teach our kids. Uh, we're going to jump right into the episode today because this is important information, important current event uh, that's going on. And what we're going to be talking about today is just how the segregated living um, in America has created um, a, a pandemic. It's caused a pandemic in the African-American communities and societies, especially when it comes to um uh, housing situations, when it comes to loan situations, when it comes to just um, the equity and and, uh, and racial segregation within the communities, um, it, it's bigger than just the Jim Crow in itself. It, it, it's, it was elsewhere as well. But let's look at the current event that this ties to, which is Ahmaud Arbery, who of course was shot back in February 2020, uh, when he had a confrontation with uh, the brothers Gregory and Travis uh, McMichael. Um, it took more than two months for one for them to even arrest these two gentlemen. Uh, the father and son, right? Father, 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 and father and son, father and son, and they also arrested a third person who, who filmed the entire uh, thing. Uh, the McMichaels are argued that they were defending themselves while trying to make a citizen's arrest. Now, anybody that know Georgia law, citizen's arrest comes when you've actually seen a crime committed, in which. Um, these three gentlemen did not see a crime being committed. Um, Mr. Arbery was out for an afternoon jog in, in the coastal city of Brunswick when the elder Mc, uh, Mr. McMichael, a neighborhood resident, um, told police he believed that Mr. Arbery resembled the suspect in a series of local break-ins. Police have said no reports were filed regarding these alleged break-ins. Now, just looking at this case from above, he said that he resembled somebody, a uh, suspect, but they had no idea who the suspect was. So they're just assuming that a suspect was probably black and not from their neighborhood that was uh, breaking into stuff. But during the trial, the owner of the property, uh, Larry English, 
said that, you know, looking at the videotape that Albury was on this property, but he didn't take anything nor destroy anything. And he said it wasn't something new because a lot of people have been on this prop, been on that property, just looking at it. Uh, children been uh, on videotaped on there. Couples have been uh, videotaped on there. And he said he never made this uh, this information public to that neighborhood watch or neighborhood that these people were on his property and that he considered Mr. Arbery to be a suspect in the um in the break-ins in that community. But uh Amar Arbery was killed in a small, mostly white coastal neighborhood called Satilla Shores, about two miles away from, you know, where his family lived. Um but it said that he had jogged that, you know, in that neighborhood plenty of times. Um, but just on this fatal day he was approached by three men trying to apprehend him and um he was killed. But how does that tie into what we're talking about today is because when you look at predominantly white neighborhoods, um, this is something that when we talk about systematic oppression that we've been talking about, this is something that happened over the course of, uh, of American society to keep black people out of these neighborhoods for these situations to happen. Now, you can look on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, and start to see more and more videos being shown of black people being in white neighborhoods and being approached by white uh residents about being in their neighborhood uh y'all comments on that Go ahead, <laughs> well you, you know my take on that this is something we've been not only talking about for years this is something we've dealt with for many years mm -hmm. um you know uh at certain points in my life living in different areas there's always been neighborhoods that you consider white and you consider it not an area that black people should go. Um, for those that that want to experience that, travel to Memphis. You can go to Memphis and and right in Memphis, Tennessee, there's places that black people frequent all day long when the sun's up. Um, mm -hmm. And when the sun goes down, they don't go to those areas. Uh, mm -hmm. It exists. And for the people that don't believe that, you, you just haven't been in those areas, but they exist. Georgia, not one of my favorite states, as you guys know, and just talking about not even the, 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 the vicinity of where this crime took place, but just, this, just listen to the words of the judge. The judge said, and this was shortly after the jury selection, the judge says, it appears to be some discrimination going on here, mm -hmm. yet this judge let the trial continue. Yeah. So even the judge recognized something's wrong. Right. Because there's only one black juror left. Absolutely, right? because the 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 defense decided, well, they made the decision that they didn't they wanted to limit the number of black jurors that they possibly could. Mm -hmm. And they did an excellent job because you only got left with one. Mm -hmm. And the judge cited that there appears to be some discrimination. Mm -hmm. Yet he let the trial continue. So we're not just talking about when we look at segregation and we look at communities. People think it's just the folks that live in the community. It is not. Mm -hmm. It is the people that control everything about that community. Mm -hmm. You can look in black neighborhoods. We talked about it a couple of podcasts ago. You can live in a predominantly black community. And not control anything. And not control anything mm -hmm. in that community. That's segregation. Yeah. So I don't think people really understand true definition of segregation or oppression. Mm -hmm. And it's things like this hopefully we'll have people to start thinking about those two things completely different mm -hmm. than how they were probably taught before. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a great example. Your thoughts? Uh, I mean, you see segregation here in Bedford with, uh, where Elba Butcher at. Once you pass Elba Butcher, it no longer looks like the other side of Bedford. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times that side of the Bedford doesn't get the things that the other side did. Mm -hmm. You know, the other side just got... Um, uh, what is the condos? Mm -hmm. Now they're building new condos on that side. Nothing over here. Mm -hmm. Well, on, on this side, we get more Section 8 apartments. Right. Is, is what we get. Oh, and we're, we're going to talk, we're going to get into that a little bit too on, on why that happens. Um, again, you could correlate this on Maude, Albury, Albury situation to eight years ago with Trayvon Martin, who's also not running in the neighborhood, but just walking in the neighborhood. Um, and he was killed because he looked suspicious. Mm -hmm. You know, when when black people are in certain in white neighborhoods, they look suspicious. Um, but you can see a white person in a white neighborhood and they don't look suspicious. Why? Because they blend in. They they look like they belong in that community. Okay. That's a form of of, of of discrimination and racism. So you see a black person. And it, it's not 
oh, this person can live up here. This person can live up the street. When you see all Ahmad Arbery running through a neighborhood, it's not, oh, he may be from the neighboring neighborhood and he may know somebody in this neighborhood. It's, it's already suspect, um, like for white people to look at him that way. Um, but here's just a, a few of them. I, I will be here all day if I go through all of these, but I'm going to just go through a few. Uh, 1909 race war in Minneapolis over blacks moving into a white neighborhood. Now, when I say race war or race riot, it's not talking about black people uh, committing violence against white people. You know, Louis Farrakhan always say, you know, there is no history of black people creating mass violence against white people. You only see it the other way. So when you say when you see race riots in history, it's mostly it's well, predominantly white people against black people killing them um, for for things that they didn't agree with, which one of them is housing. Um, 1947 Fernwood uh, Park race riot to stop black veterans from moving into white housing projects. Now, white housing projects, well, the housing projects was to um, give people housing that well, was coming back from the war, especially and during a, a depression time. That's right. But they even segregated the housing, the, the public housing, so what they didn't want black veterans returning from the war to stay in wild, white housing projects. The same situation happened a year earlier in 1946 at the airport homes race riot where black veterans were um, were trying to move into a predominantly well to into a white um, housing project. Uh, the Cicero race riot of 1951 when a mob of 4000 whites attacked an apartment building that housed a single black family in the neighborhood. Uh, you had Trumbull Park Homes riot in, in 1953, where Betty Howard, a light-skinned black woman, and her family tried to move into the project starting on August 5th and lasting for weeks. White residents of the projects attacked the Howard home with rocks, fireworks, with police doing little to stop them. Um, in 1942, black families attempted to move into their homes in Detroit, where they were met with violence and intimidation from white mobs and were... Um, ultimately deny entry to their homes. So just looking at the history, you can see how white people did not want blacks moving into their neighborhoods. And this had nothing to do with value from a bank account. This okay. had everything to do with value of a skin, skin color. color. So we talked, you talked about this on a podcast earlier that when Black people marry white people. They saw it as devaluing their family. The same way that you go with housing. Whenever a black family moved nearby or in that neighborhood, it was a concept that it was devaluing the neighborhood and the property around it. That's right. Um, whenever black and brown people would move in. But we saw a uh, FDR pass the New Deal, the Fair Housing Act. But what this did was it created another form of segregation. And when we think of segregation, we always think of the Jim Crow South. That's right. But segregation moved beyond the South into the areas of the North, the Northwest, the Northeast, and out West. Mm -hmm. um, in which the, you know, the government primarily designed uh, to provide housing to middle class whites and lower class white families, excluding black people from being able to purchase these homes. And they created what they called redlining. That's right. And what they would do, they would draw a map of the district or the city or the neighborhood, and they would classify it by colors. Green mean best. If the area was shaded green, that means it's best. Um, this is the best area to live. Um, the blue was still desirable. The yellow was a declining area, and the red was hazard. Now, they would only do the red hazard if a single black family lived in the neighborhood. So if one black family lived in this neighborhood, it was considered hazardous and, and it was redlined. And this would bring down the property value and they would not issue mortgages out to even black people when the red line in places. So, um, but meanwhile, they were uh, sending out mortgages in the yellow, blue and green areas for white people, but not black people. This allow white people to control the housing market while black people were pushed into the areas that we call the slums or the projects. Your comments on that, Pop? You know, that's, that's exactly what happened. Um, and I, I think another part that I don't think people understand that it, what it created was traffic. Yeah. So when people talk about why do so many uh, impoverished people use public transportation, it has, it's not only because 
you can't avoid the you can't afford to buy a vehicle. It's also because you're forced to live in an area, but your employment is going to be somewhere else. Because when we talked about impoverished areas, we're not only talking about the living conditions, but we're talking about economical and financial development. Mm-hmm. There's no employment there. Mm-hmm. So you have to work outside of that area to be able to stay where you are. Right. So you need to, you need transportation. Thus, you get public transportation. So it created a, 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 an array of things that we think affect blacks disproportionately. Mm-hmm. And that's one of them. The other thing is, is that and we talked about this on many podcasts as well. When you don't have economical development and you don't have any opportunities for financial gain, when you have no outlook for a better education, mm-hmm. you don't have one important aspect for, for civilization, mm-hmm. which is called hope. Mm-hmm. So without hope, what do you have? Right. Nothing. Nothing. And, and that's so for me, one of the biggest things that this type of scenario has created is the lack of hope in the black community. Mm-hmm. And when there's lack of when there's lack of hope, you end up turning to things that are going to be disproportionately negative mm-hmm. towards you and your family. Crime, drugs, mm-hmm. alcohol abuse, even even domestic violence. Mm-hmm. These are the things that stem from these conditions. Mm-hmm. And, and so we can go on and on. Like you said, we can go on and on all day about these situations and where these situations are. But I guarantee you, most of the viewers can think back and they can associate some of these things that we're talking about because you were putting a situation that there was no opportunities for. You. Yeah. It kind of push you towards to do whatever it is you've done or are doing. Mm-hmm. Even the jobs that you choose is based on the conditions of your living em- environment. Mm-hmm. So. And you just spoke about that because you talked about mm-hmm. how systematic racism does not just occur with the people that live in the neighborhood, who controls the neighborhood. So when you push black people into the areas that we call the slums or the ghettos mm-hmm. or the projects, you know, you still don't control anything economically about those That's neighborhoods. Right. So if the if the the people who put you there still own the stores, That's right. they still run the school system, they still um, control the economic development of it. Which we've seen, especially when it comes to public housing, that even right. when you push the black housing and the white housing, the black housing got less funding. We've seen that the um, that the elevators weren't getting fixed. The things around That's it right. were, were beginning to deteriorate while in the white, uh, what things everything was getting done effectively. And what correlates to crime is poverty. That's right. To, to, um, especially when you look at when it started, which is after the war. So you coming back from war, and to a depression area, and now migration. you can't find a, a a job, and now you're living on public assistance, okay. but everything around you is negative. You have to find some way to make ends meet. Um, your thoughts on right. what we talked about? I mean, so uh, when when black people are pushed to the slums, there's nothing there because landlords abandon buildings. Yeah, uh, city transportation is unreliable. Most places, when that happens, crime increases. Yeah. Um, I, I read some. It was uh, all these conditions. They lasted for 30 years uh, while white people fleed to the new suburbs. Mm-hmm. Um, and in those suburbs, they instituted rules called covenants, mm-hmm. which was forbidding, forbidding selling uh, black people homes. And it was perfectly legal. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that's what you're saying was they moved to these what we call the metropolitan areas. And the areas around it is considered suburbs. And those are the areas where white people wanted to move out of the, the place so you can travel into the city. But they want to keep black people out of those suburbs. Um, Cabrini Green is a great example mm-hmm. of, of what we're talking about, where you had Cabrini Green. For those that don't remember, we did this on several podcasts. Yeah. That's where they filmed the um, the uh, the comedy um, um, Good Times. Mm-hmm. Um, also that's where you get Candyman from for mm-hmm. those that like movies, but they built these, these projects. It was supposed to be subsidized housing. Um, and they call them projects because that's what it was. It was a project. Let's see if this works. Right. And obviously they built it in an area that was red line. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the other side, you had all these great opportunities and on the south side, you had all these great, great opportunities. But in the area where Cabrini Green was, there was no opportunities. And the only way, the only reason they fixed that was because how do you connect these two affluent areas? Mm-hmm. The only way to do that is you have to upgrade where Cabrini Green was. Mm-hmm. And they did that. And how do you do that? You force all the people that's living in those projects out oh, of the yeah, projects. Right. So now we can reconstruct something different mm-hmm. that you won't be able to afford. Gentr- and that's exactly what happened. You look, right? you look at uh, 
to make it to bring it more prevalent, the Barclays Center in in Brooklyn. Black people were living where the Barclays was at. They moved them out That's so right. they could build the stadium. There. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, the Color of Law is one book uh, you can read on this by Richard Rothstein. And the book he was just talking about, about Cabrini Green, High Risers. Um, go check those books out. Um, you can find both of these books actually in um, Barnes and Noble, um, your local Barnes and I wanna, Noble. I want to bring up one more thing before we move on to another subject is we want to talk about how a chain reaction can cause certain things because obviously for a lot of people, they would like to know how are some of these things starting to be talked about more now than they did, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Because this has been going on for eons. So here's what happens. And, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to blame Donald Trump for everything that's going on. But I do want to mention a couple things about Donald Trump. First, let's talk about what Ice Cube talked about before the election. All right. A lot of, of us ridiculed Ice Cube for something that he said. He said, you know what? Let's say day one, we remove Donald Trump. We vote Donald Trump out. You vote in Biden. What happens to black America? Mm -hmm. Well, for those that wanted to crucify him for making that statement, I want to tell you what, I want to ask you what has happened for black America since Biden has became president, mm -hmm. okay? So what Donald Trump did in his run for president, presidency and winning, they even white America could care less about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. What he did is he put a filler out there mm -hmm. to find out how many Americans believe what I believe in. Mm -hmm. How many Americans think the way that I do? And he found out because he won an election that I tell you right now, he probably didn't think he could win. Mm -hmm. But he found out how many people agree with the way he thinks. So what do you have now is you have states like Texas mm -hmm. who said, we know we got a lot of people that think like Donald Trump. We don't need yeah. you no more, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. We can take it from here. Mm -hmm. On that podcast, two weeks before the election, mm -hmm. what did I say was going to happen? Mm -hmm. Virginia was going to follow suit. If you guys listen to your newly elected governor, Yonkin, is saying now they're going to create more charter schools than mm -hmm. ever before. What are charter schools? <laughs> it's a, it's a, a different option than going to public schools. Mm -hmm. And why don't they want to go to public schools? They don't want to go to school with black kids. <laughs> They don't want to talk about, they don't want to hear anything about critical race theory. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about slavery. They don't want to talk about Martin Luther King and civil rights. They don't want to talk about any of those things. But we still want to get public funding, federal funding. Yeah. They can get that as that, a charter school, that's the not difference a private between, school, that's the difference between a charter private school. school and charter school. Yeah. So for those that want to know what we're talking about and how it applies to you, this is what we're talking about. This is why we were trying to warn you and get you ready for what was coming. Not Donald Trump. Right. Yeah. Donald Trump did his job. He was the filler. He he went fishing. How many bites am I going to get? Well, he got millions of bites. Mm -hmm. And now you're starting to see what's happening after that. Even when we look at what's going on in Georgia, I'm going to take you guys back for a quick second because we're talking about locations and, and, and segregation in those areas. I don't know if people remember. I want to make sure I get his name right, right? His name was Kendrick. Um, let me get his name right. Hold on one second. Kendrick Johnson. People may have forgotten about Kendrick Johnson. Kendrick Johnson was a 17-year-old teenager who was found rolled mm. up yeah. in a gym mat in one of my less favorite states, Georgia, <laughs> again. And they ruled it an accidental death. So for those that's trying to get this picture, if you go into some gyms, they have these uh, wrestling mats, they're rolled up like a drum and they stand straight up. And when you stand them up, this one was about six feet tall. And Kendrick Johnson was five foot 10 and some change, almost five foot 11. They claimed that he put his shoes inside of the gym mat because he didn't want to pay for a locker to, to house his stuff while he participated in gym. And when gym was over, he tried to go down in there and get his shoes and he got stuck and he died. So for people that's thinking, okay, how did he die? Well, when you head first, blood rushes to your head, you basically suffocate. And in most cases, blood ends up coming out of whatever openings you have, mouth, nose, ears, even sometimes reportedly even your eyes, right? And they, they claim that's what happened. Mm -hmm. They ruled it a homicide. 2013, they ruled it a homicide. 
So when they tried to do a reinvestigation and they go look at the body, the funeral home has removed his organs and replaced them with newspaper. Now, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, I'm not a writer, so I'm not making this up. You can Google it. Yeah. So now they can't even do any more research as far as that goes because the funeral home has screwed this whole thing up, right? So it's an accident. So they reopened the case recently. They reopened the case. And here's some evidence that we did not know about in 2013 or 2017 or 2020 that we found out in 2021. Kendrick had an altercation with two brothers, white, white kids, early in the week. Their dad is an FBI agent. <laughs> they exhumed the body, find out that he had blunt force trauma to the head. Also, if his shoe was already in the mat and he goes down in the mat, even if he, if he bled out because the blood rushed to his head, Blood would be on top of the shoe, yeah. not on the bottom, bottom of the shoe. Of the shoe. Right. But blood was on the bottom of the shoe. And by the way, both shoes were in there. So mm -hmm. he wasn't just looking for one shoe, as they said. Mm -hmm. So obviously, one more point. The radius, oh, diameter, sorry. The diameter of the rolled up mat was less than 16 inches. Mm -hmm. I think it was 13 inches. From shoulder to shoulder, Kendrick was 19 inches. How does that happen? Except by force. Yeah. He was thrown in the mat, and then his shoes thrown over there with him right. to, to hide the, the evidence and the body. Not to mention, video footage shows him going in the gym. And after that, for an hour, from an hour, the video footage is miraculously <laughs> gone. gone. Yeah. Disappeared. Yeah. So for those that say, okay, Jerome, what does this mean? <laughs> if I got to explain you that to you, it out. if I got to explain that to you, go back to episode one. We're what, 27 now? Yeah. Go back to episode one and get all the way to 27. And I guarantee you <laughs> that question will be answered more times than not. Absolutely. But anybody that's 30 years or older know that when it comes to those mats, you really can't get nothing inside of them. That's right. Unless you force them. Yeah. Because they rolled up pretty tight. Yeah, yeah they are. Um, we're gonna take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. And we are back. Uh, we're gonna jump right back in. Um, again with the redlining thing, um, as we wrap this part up, um, you know, the redlining area was not just African Americans, it was also other minorities that were looked down upon. But one of the things that happened in Chicago, New York, uh, Detroit, Philadelphia, when it came to these things was they were subject, as you talked about, to be moved out because during this time period is when, especially New York, went crazy with the highways. So whenever they wanted to clear land for highways, guess whose land they was going to clear? The That's red right. area. And this was also a way to separate the neighborhoods. So even when you look at from a buyer's standpoint that I can afford to be in this neighborhood, but they won't allow me to live in this neighborhood, which means I even... If I'm living good, you know, I have to stay in this neighborhood. Uh, on Sunset Park, um, <laughs> Fredro Starr said this. And, you know, she said, you know, he asked the, the, his coach, you know, what's it like to be white? Mm -hmm. And, you know, she asked him, what's it like to be black? And he said, you know, Mr. Collins go to work every day, work hard, and he comes home. And then he said, you know, there's a drunk that sits outside and they never had a job a day in his life. He said they both live in the same neighborhood. They both live the same life. And he was talking about was that redlining thing that even though Mr. Right. Collins works, he can't afford to, well, he can afford it, but he can't go to another neighborhood and live because they, they don't him. want him there. That's right. So when you look at how that works, that don't, that not only affects the adults, that affects the kids. Because uh, Muhammad Ali spoke about this in, in his book was even living in a black neighborhood, it was fine sometimes. But guess what? The pools was in the white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The amusement parks with the fairs, the circus, when the they came, they was in the white neighborhood. That's right. And guess what? We can't go, we can't over, go there. over there. We, 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 he talked about they used to have to watch from the fence while the kids got to ride the rides at the parks and all of this other stuff while they, they could not participate in that only because they didn't live in that neighborhood and they, weren't, they didn't, couldn't have access to that neighborhood. Right. So when you look at redlining, it not only affected the buyer, it affected the people
coming after it. It only affected because one of the 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 contradictions was that we talked about the devalue thing. That once a black family move in, it devalues the property. Well, that's entirely cor- incorrect because guess what? Black people were willing to pay more for the property than a white family would. Okay. They would the interest rates was going to be higher. All of this was going to be higher, so the value of the property was actually higher if a black family was to move in. Right. And how does that affect us today? Because the houses that was on the market in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, that black people were denied access to, they're worth 60% more do- uh, 60% more wealth and value today's Today. market. That's right. That means that people who did get the houses, guess what? They family got generational wealth. How many black families do you know to say, oh, my grandmother just died. I got to figure out how to get the deed to the house. I got to figure out what I'm going to do with that, that land that she left me, the land that granddad left me. We don't have that. Why? Because in, in their times, they didn't have access to those wealth. So again, they put us in segregate. I mean, they put us in the public housing that you don't own. That's right. It was, we still see today where there, there are people who are 70 years old that still live in Rain Tree That's and right. Pine Crest because why? They get That's rent right. assistance. Absolutely. They That's keep you right. from going to buy something. If you if you talk to your granddad, you guys can call him after this podcast. He'll tell you that what he paid for that house at 1820 Bay Street that mm-hmm. we grew up in, uh, what he paid for it back then compared to what he sold it for. Mm-hmm. Is, is, he won't even tell you the number. <laughs> right? He won't even tell you how much profit he made. Because obviously when he bought the house, he bought it at the going rate. Like I said, it was predominantly black. Mm-hmm. Like D.C., the original Chocolate City, over 70 percent was black during that time. By the time he sold it, because what happened was the property value went up. Now, mm-hmm. although it was predominantly black, white people slowly started trickling back in yeah. because the property had value. Right. Why? It was still considered Capitol Hill. Mm-hmm. It had access to all these different areas in D.C. You're on the border of Washington uh, to Maryland on one side and Virginia on the other. Mm-hmm. And it was a perfect location for white America. Yeah. So once white America started coming back in, black people start saying, you know what? You want this property? You can get it. Here's the price. <laughs> right. Yeah. They bought it up, mm-hmm. you know. So obviously, I think at the end of the day, people are finding out or should be finding out that we do have access to certain things. We have to be smart about it. We have to be ready when the opportunity arises to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And then once you take advantage of it, you become the controller. Mm -hmm. And then you can do what you want to do with it. And I think it's great because my dad wasn't the only one that did that. There's so many people that that own homes in that community did the same thing and then went and bought a house somewhere out in the country. Right. Right. So obviously, white America has been trying to hold us down for many years from doing things like that. And we're now starting to take advantage of it. And we have to continue because they're going to change the laws to try to prevent you from being able to do that. And we see that now with what's going on in Texas, what's happening in Virginia. And you can look at what's going on in Georgia. Even just talking about the stand your ground um, with the trial going on with 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 Rittenhouse, uh, uh, the Cal Rittenhouse in Wisconsin, <laughs> and then the stand your ground with uh, um, Ahmaud Arbery, how they've already changed the law in that state as to citizens arrest. The problem is, why did a black guy have to die before you went back? Not just die. Let me, let me take that back. Why did a white guy have to die and then charges be brought against the killers before you change the law? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Because we know this has been going on for many, many years. It's just you haven't always charged the white individuals for the crime. Yeah. Now they're being charged. Now we ought to think about changing the law. Not because we care about the blacks being killed. Right. We don't want to continue to have to put these people on trial right. for that. Right. Right. And we gonna we need to get into a little bit about this Kyle Rittenhouse. Well, we know Kyle Rittenhouse is a hero, and Trayvon Martin was a thug. We know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And 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 now with Kyle Rittenhouse, you have a judge. <laughs> I, I still can't. I still can't even get over this. Mm-hmm. You have a judge who has said during the trial, the two victims that were killed Mm -hmm. and the one that was wounded, you can't call them victims. Mm -hmm. You can only call them rioters and looters. (laughs) You can't call them victims. And then he chastised the prosecutor for 20 minutes. They adjourned, came back the next day, and he chastised them for another hour in front of the jury. Right. 
So for those that are saying, well, Jerome, how do you think the trial's gonna turn out? <laughs> well, we know. They got the National Guard on, on call right now. Yeah. So that tells you how everybody thinks this trial is gonna turn out. My man's gonna get found now guilty of the murders. Mm -hmm. He gonna get found guilty of possession, possessing a firearm at the age of 17. Right. But he gonna get found now guilty of the murders. Oh, that's absolutely, absolutely. We know. We Listen, black people got an expectation whenever it comes to our justice system. It's, and, you know, I'm surprised that you're surprised. Um, uh, one last thing on the redlining. California just developed a task force to, um, to do a study on reparations. And by doing this study, they uh, created a, um, a group of people who went around doing home appraisals. So what the home appraisals was, they realized there was a discrimination in the home appraisals because if a white person was doing the home appraisal of a black family, they were marketing it at a lower, lower value right. than everything else. So there was this one black family who, you know, they had the woman come in and she, you know, marketed their house and they ended up doing another home appraisal and allowed a white couple to pose as the homeowners. Value went through the roof. Value went up $500,000 more. So back in September, California passed the Fair Appraisal Act to stop things like this from happening. Because this is something that's been happening. That's, but it's not going to go in effect, I think, until 2023. So this is something that's still occurring, even with something like a home appraisal that black families are getting lowballed, even on their, on their housing. <laughs> I, and, and I know people have heard jokes and anybody who watched Martin, you've seen on episodes of Martin, when people call 911, if you sound like you're a black person, the response time is slower. Yeah. If you sound like you're white, the response time is faster. Or if the victim is white, mm -hmm. you know, if you call and say, hey, I just seen a white lady get mugged, cops will be there faster. They get there. Where's the white lady got mugged? Oh, it's the black lady. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, and we, we think that's a joke because it sounds funny. It happens. It's true. It's true. It's true. They did a case study. Actually, uh, um, Harvard University did a case study where they had uh, a group of white people uh, call about a uh, apartment in, in, in affluent Manhattan and the apartments were vacant and they got got information, was able to go in and see the apartment. But when they had black people who sounded black call all of us minutes within minutes. All of a sudden, these apartments aren't available. Yeah. And, and you know, like you said, I'm surprised you're surprised. I'm surprised you're surprised. A lot of people are surprised that this happens. Why? <laughs> Only people that are surprised are white people. Right. We're not surprised. We're not surprised. Um, that leads me into um, sundown, sundown towns or sundown counties. Like Memphis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you hate to see <laughs> <laughs> he ain't the South. He just don't want to go South, like, at all. <laughs> like, just, like... Oh, would you prefer me to say Mississippi? <laughs> yeah, Mississippi. Okay, we can go there. Uh, sundown towns are all white communities, neighborhoods, or counties that excluded blacks and other minorities through the use of discriminatory laws, harassment, and threats or the use of violence. South Carolina. Uh, well, yeah, and the South was huge about this, but... Um, the Midwest and the, and the Northwest became real prevalent when it came to uh, sundown counties, uh, which the name derives from the posting of verbal warnings issued to blacks that, you know, you better not be here when sundown. You know, right. you, you, you we see you during the day when the sun go down. Okay. That's when our hood's coming on and you better not be out here. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, so when you watch the Western movie and they, they reference that, you know, you got till sundown to get out of here. This is where that comes from. Um, but historians estimate that there were up to 10,000 sundown towns in the US, United States between 1890 and 1960. Um, black began, blacks began to migrate to the areas of the West and predominantly white neighborhoods there said, you look, we don't want them here. So, you know, they would issue, uh, they would have signs outside of it that says, uh, uh, niggas don't let the sun go down on you here. That's right. You know, um, Whites only after dark. So in the South, you go there and you see whites only on the on the sign of the, the store. When you start going Midwest and West, they had the sign on by the speed limit. Look, <laughs> whites only after dark. <laughs> so you uh, many sundown towns, you discriminate housing 
uh, covenants to ensure that non-white person would be allowed to purchase. So when it came to the covenants and the deeds, they were writing the deeds, they would write a covenant. And in the covenant, it would say, do not sell to African-Americans. Only sell, words like, only sell to the Aryans. That's right. Only sell to whites. On Do not sell to the Negro. These were in contracts. Um, and the Supreme Court at the time couldn't do nothing about it because they were contracts amongst the people um, to not sell those places. Um, and then it was incumbent upon the residents who lived in that area to help enforce that. Yeah. Even if they had to talk to potential buyers. If they were black, they had to let them know, you, you ain't welcome here. Yeah. You know, that was part of the agreement is they had to help facilitate that. A lot of these towns had postcards saying, saying things like a good right. place to live, but no Negroes. Um, we got cold summers, mild winters, no blizzards, and no Negroes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a set of advertisement. That was selling. That's right. You know, you know African Americans who lingered in the sundown towns were, you know, harassed and again, then told, you know, if you hear when the sun go down, you know, things is going to happen. And, you know, black people had, as we talked about driving, you know, black people had to come up with their own green book. They had to know where to stop for gas. They had to know what hotels to stop at. They had to know which counties not to stop in, not to go in after sundown. Look, look how creative black people get, though. We had to. We had no choice. You want to stay alive. We survivors. <laughs> yeah, survivors. Hey, we survivors. survivors. Hey, look. Survivors. Keep going through that town. Don't stop. And if you ever been to Myrtle Beach or Florida and you drive <laughs> itself, some of those tales still look like it. You don't, uh, I'm rather not get right gas. Now, you, I plan a trip to Texas, and, and Cameron to tell you guys this. He planned a te trip to Texas. He made sure if they was going to stop, it was a town that was brother-friendly, <laughs> right? You plan. It, it sounds crazy that we're doing that, but you have to do yeah, that. Yeah, no, I got to see a brother. When he went to Marshall, <laughs> it, this is you can't make this up. We're going to Marshall, taking them to school. We go to McDonald's. Literally, the lady says, oh, you must be going to school up here. Right? Yeah. And Baker was like, why does she think that? <laughs> it ain't, look around, it ain't probably with the brother. So obviously, if you're going to school, you just got out of jail. One of the two. That even when we went to, uh, who was it? Allegheny. Allegheny. <laughs> Allegheny. Before we stopped at the store, we said, yo, we got to see a brother before we pull over. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so even just looking at the Sundown Counters, we... <laughs> The Ahmaud Arbery situation, you know, I've seen people posting on Facebook like, how could that happen? How could they just, you know, stop somebody and run it? If you're black, you know. Yeah, you know? You know. If you know, you know. Like, I live in a predominantly white neighborhood. I don't feel comfortable running up the street. That's right. I don't. You know what I mean? Like, if you know, you know. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's just come like, it's... Survival of the fittest is natural. It's our natural instincts now in America to know. Look, I ain't no black people around. Maybe I I don't need to be here. You know, it's <laughs> funny. I see people even today, every day, that either their tags are expired, been expired for in some cases two years. Yeah. Inspections. Some of them don't even have inspection stickers. Let mine be one day out. It could be the thirtieth. <laughs> yeah. The 30th was yesterday, or the 31st was yesterday. The day is the first cops for me. Mr. Battle, notice your tags yeah, expired. Yeah, right. People are driving around for years with expired tags and don't get pulled over because yeah. they don't look like me. Mm -hmm. It happens. And if it didn't happen to you, tell me what you're doing. Right. <laughs> Hit me up. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. But obviously, we're not making this stuff up. This is what happens, and it happens on a daily basis. Right. I mean, like, for real. Like, you go into a store... You know, you might want to take your hood off. Not that it's wrong. You just want to minimize the chances of, yeah. of you getting followed. You want to minimize the chances of them think that you're stealing. That's right. You know what I'm saying? When you in the car, I know we like to, you know, give the police a hard time. But sometimes you just want to minimize, like, I know what it, black people know what this can escalate to. That's right. You know, white person to sit there and argue, what did you pull me over for? You know, what what, what yeah. is this? You get out the car on them. And look, let me tell That's you right. something. Black people trying to minimize that. You know what I'm saying? We because we, we know what it can escalate to. We want to go home. You know, uh, hopefully. Facts. Y'all got anything else on the Sundown counties? Just look, give me your perspective. What do you think of that? Are these still? I don't want to add, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> Is it still a lot of these cities now? They may not have the signs posted. But they still. But you see the look in their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you would definitely see the look in the eye. I think I told you guys off off air one time where me and 
Jazz and um, one of his friends, Chase, we were driving, we was in Texas and we were driving somewhere. And we thought we knew where we were going and the cops pulled us over. Cop turned around and pulled us over. And uh, I wasn't speeding. He said, no, sir, you guys weren't speeding. He said, but I know you're lost. How do you know that, <laughs> sir? He said, because the direction you're going in about five minutes, I wouldn't even be able to help you. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he looked at he pulled his hand up and said, you understand? And my cousin was like, yeah, yeah, we understand. Yeah. He said, well, what I want you to do is I want you to turn around. I'm going to turn my lights on. I want you to follow me. And I'll get you back to where you're safe. <laughs> so you asking me, does it still exist? Yeah. <laughs> Look at my face. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, um, you said, again, what you said earlier is, is crucial because it may not exist as with the signs outside of the counties. Now it's controlled by the judge, the lawyer, right. as, as it was back then, too. But now it's prevalent. This is how in Florida, this is how Zimmerman gets away with what he gets away with. That's right. This they is how they, it posted. Yeah. they got people. This, this, is, people. this is our town. He's right. innocent here. That's right. Look how it's innocent by our standards. That's right. Absolutely. He's a hero. He's a patriot. Trayvon Martin is a thug. This is this is what you deal with when you go down the south. This is what you deal when you go to the Midwest. This is this is it's again, it's not in your face. It's a systematic way of doing things. Um there was there was a white guy who did a um kind of like a little video back after um George Floyd got killed and he had Black Lives Matter sign and they considered like the most racist place in Mississippi. And Every white person that drove by him said something to him and say, look, black lives don't matter. White lives matter. All lives matter. You get away from around here with that. That's how, that's how they think down there. Now, there may be black people that live down there, but it's still controlled by the thing. You hate to say it. You look at Bedford mm -hmm. with this past election. They went to the polls specifically, like you said, Donald Trump brought out the way that they think. So they didn't even need Donald Trump. That's right. The Republican Party underneath Yunkin or whatever, this is our town. You, We're not teaching that black history stuff in That's our right. schools. That's we're right. not doing none of that. We're doing that. So this is a systematic way of doing that. It, it, it's not, it doesn't have to be you know, white people like to say, well, racism is it that. I, I didn't call you a nigger or to your face. <laughs> no, you ain't call me a nigger to my face, but you let me know you don't care about black people when right. you don't want to talk about certain things, right. when you don't want to address certain things. It's a different way of handling them. And we have to be smart enough to understand this. Um, we'll take a quick commercial break when we're right back because I know it's something dad dying to get in. Um, and we're back. And we're going to jump right back in. Um, it's something that we've been wanting to talk about for a little while now, and I think this is a good time to segue into this, is um, the difference in Amber Alerts of missing black girls versus, or missing black girls or black boys versus missing white girls or, or black boys. Um, Dad, I'll let you jump into that, because this is something you've been talking about for a few years now, and I kind of want to bring it to the attention of the audience, um, especially with a lot more missing cases coming forth. Um, that I've been seeing personally myself. Yeah, I think um, first let's let's start with this. African American children make up about fourteen percent of the U.S. population, but account for forty percent of all reports of missing children, mm -hmm. and that's astonishing. But let's go more specific to Amber Alert. First, the problem with Amber Alert, just so people who may not fully understand what that is, you may have watched the movie, or whatever. The thing is, Amber Alert, there's qualifications to be that you have to meet before you get an Amber Alert sent out. Mm -hmm. And the very first one is the one that's a problem is it has to be an abduction. So <laughs> it's not just the child that goes missing. They have, they have to, to be, be abducted. abducted and you have to have reasonable evidence, mm -hmm. not suspicion, evidence that there's an abduction that likely took place. Mm -hmm. Just saying that alone, people, what the hell does that mean? Well, I couldn't tell you. Right. Because that, unless you actually saw, or in most cases, just so we're clear, in most cases, it's usually a parent involved in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to prove that 
or have that kind of evidence when you first call the cops. So let's let's make that clear too. Because I don't want people to assume that Amber Alert goes out every time a child is missing. That's not the case. Right. Here's the other problem with Amber Alert, especially when it's viewed by white America and or, or law enforcement. For black children, the first thing they look at, are there ensuing situations because of their environment, behavior, where they live, parents, crime, history. Mm -hmm. So all these things are taken into account before you can classify them as missing, first of all, mm -hmm. because the first thing they want to say is the child ran away. This has happened. Yeah. And this has happened locally. Yeah. So when we think about the Amber Alert, there's quality. Matter of fact, I think I have them, the qualifications for Amber Alert. So let me look at this. Okay. The first is there's a reasonable belief by law enforcement that an abduction has occurred. So, so you have to convince them. The law enforcement. That's right. No, so no matter what you think, you have to convince law enforcement mm -hmm. that the, an abduction has occurred, right? <laughs> law enforcement agency believes that the child is in imminent danger, danger. Mm -hmm. which normally means if it's a parent, they don't believe the parent's going to do anything to the child. Right. No Amber Alert, right? You know, again, this is being determined by law enforcement. Yeah. And for those that want to know how we feel about that situation, go back and listen to the previous podcast. There has to be enough descriptive information about the victim and the abduction for law enforcement to issue an Amber Alert mm -hmm. to assist in recovery of the child. So the first the first three steps is you left it in the police officer's hands who you're telling. Absolutely. Now, it has to be, is that the case where it has to be 48 hours before you can that, legally that, say that's missing? For, that's for missing. missing and that's okay. for a child. For a child, it's not that. For an adult, it's 48 hours. Okay, I got All you. Right? I got you. Um, the abduction is of a child age 17 years or younger. Mm -hmm. That's another one, which I'm not sure where that came up because 17, you could still be in high school. Yeah. Um, and we actually had an incident. What was her name? Um, in Alex Amherst. Alexis, Alexis Murphy. Murphy. Alexis Murphy in yeah. Nelson County. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So I, I think, and no Amber Alert was issued in that situation. Mm -hmm. no. So, because she wasn't abducted. They couldn't approve that she was abducted. Mm -hmm. Um, here's another one. The child's name and other critical data elements, including the child abduction flag, have been entered into the National Crime Information Center, which is NCIC systems. So all those things have to take place before an Amber Alert is issued. Mm -hmm. How long did it take me just to read that? A lot. So in the meantime, your child <laughs> is missing. Yeah, a lot. Right? And, and the decision hasn't even been made to issue an Amber right, Alert. Yeah. So this is not, this is a flaw of the Amber Alert system in itself. So we can blame Amber Alert all we want, we want but the Amber Alert wasn't designed for us. Yeah. Just as we've talked about in this podcast, for many of the laws that, that exist today, wasn't designed with us in, in mind. Right. So therefore it doesn't work for us. And it, it never is. There have been some changes made to where there's a different type of alert now called the, the Ryler alert. Yeah. Which is is based on the same things, um, except you do not necessarily have to prove that there was an abduction. Just the child is in immediate danger. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, and I'm not saying this, this doesn't apply in every situation. I'm just saying when you normally hear about somebody missing, whether they're a child or an adult, they talk about the imminent danger. Mm -hmm. The person has something going on medically. The person needs insulin. The person takes medication of some sort. That means Im imminent danger. So this is how they issue these alerts. And we all heard of people like, let me give you some names. Let me give you some names of some people that we heard of. Um, so when we talk about missing people, we heard of Elizabeth Smart. We've heard of Natalie Holloway. We've heard of Kaylee Anthony. We've heard of that. We, we, most of the people watch the Casey Anthony trial. Yeah. She's black. She'd be in jail right now, right? right. I mean, I mean, just be real. Yeah, but how many people... I mean, people, not only that, but you've seen the video. Of absolutely. <laughs> how many people heard of names like Tarasha Benjamin, Raymond Green, Christopher Dansbury, Shane Walker? Never heard of any of them. People that. never heard of those. Those are people who disappeared, children who disappeared without a trace, and there was no Amber Alert issue. I can go all the way back to when I was younger, there was the Atlanta child murders. And you guys may have heard about this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Where absolutely. black kids were being murdered. Mm -hmm. 
And at first it was this, there was like nothing no, coming no, out no, of Nobody coming, was doing anything. Nobody was doing anything. Until they found out the murderer might have been a black guy. Yeah. Wayne Williams was his name. And once they found out that Wayne may have been responsible for this crime. Allegedly. Allegedly. Right. You start hearing from the Georgia F Bureau of Investigation. <laughs> yeah. Once again. Your favorite that's, state. That state. Yeah. Georgia Bureau of Investigations decide to start making videos. Because yeah. before that, there was no video. They videoed uh, talking to Wayne Williams and all kinds of stuff. Why? They had a black suspect yeah. killing black kids. <laughs> yeah. In their mind, they probably would like to let the brother go. Right. You know? But it, had it been a white person that was committing these crimes, you probably would never heard about. Th this is the time where the FBI was profiling serial killers. Absolutely, and they said it was going to be a white guy in his mid uh, to, to mid twenty mid twenties to early thirties is what the profiler said. Mm -hmm. Wayne Williams was nowhere in that category. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when you look at a lot, of, a lot of people say that black children are usually excluded from those Amber Alerts because they're wrongly classified as runaways, runaways, not being abducted. Um, uh, but even if you look at a child under 18, you know, they're still missing from their respective homes and they get lack of media attention, That's right. um, than, than white people. You know, when you look at how much we account for missing persons, we only re receive about 7% of media coverage, That's right. um, which is very low, especially for the amount that actually goes missing. Especially with the things of like human trafficking that's, that's going right. on now. Forty percent. Yeah. So when you look at things like that, you know, the cases of abduction, um, <clears throat> the alert system, but you have to look at I just watched the entire America, white America, solve a crime on its own when that other when that girl just went when that girl went missing with her uh fiance. That's right. You know, I, I've seen I've seen statuses would say we'll hunt this person down ourselves. Oh yeah, and at the time they was hunting him down because he used a debit card. Yeah, he hadn't been charged with the murder yet. You know, this was somebody that was an adult, and we don't get that same type of sympathy for a little black girl missing because when you normally hear a black girl missing, the first thing people think is, oh, she's ran away. She ran away. That that's the classification that's of it. That's right. That um, or her father took her. Right. But we've we've seen so many cases, you know, of, of black women gone missing, um, that's being classified as that. And, you know, you could even look at the Alexis Murphy situation that maybe if an Amber Alert would have went out, maybe we we're, we're having a different conversation that's with that's our right. family. That's right. What, what was the uh white girl I is that she went to UVA and was going to Virginia Tech for a football game and mm -hmm. or it was vice versa, I can't remember, but we immediately knew that she was missing. When she was missing. Right. Alexis, right. we didn't find out about that until she had been missing for a while. Well, they declassified Alexis Murphy's John too, because again, they always want to criminalize it. They brought the fact in That's that right. she probably been trying to buy marijuana. The fact that she yeah. went voluntarily That's with right. these people. So th there's always a way of criminalizing a That's black right. person in, in these situations. The, the other problem, and this is not just Amber Alert oriented. This is missing children. Missing oriented. children. If they're it, under 18 and they're not in their respective homes, that's that right. is, that's the problem. That's right. and, and one of the biggest issues is, is that a lot of these things are state to state. So they're ran by the state or the local government. So these are the people that remember I said before, and Baker just said it too, is that really it's not just the laws. It's the people that are applying the laws, the ones that are deciding what we can do and what we can't and what we will and what we won't do. This is part of the problem. So if those people Let's just use the word bias. Okay. <laughs> Let's say those people are biased for whatever reason. Then these things aren't going to happen. Amber alerts aren't going to be issued. Mm -hmm. Missing reports aren't going to be sent out. And nobody's going to know this person or child is missing until it's too late, until you find a body or whatever. Right? If they're black. Because the bias is usually color related. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. It's usually color related. And that's the problem. So you you have no guidelines that force them to do anything. Mm -hmm. They get to choose. As long as they get to choose, who do you think they're going to choose? Yeah. You know, so unless you have Nancy Grace, because here's what happens. This is what usually happens. Somebody on mainstream media mm -hmm. gets a hold to a case and put it out there. Don Lemon, yeah. you know, put it out there. Nancy Grace was good at doing that as well. After she got backlash for not doing it, then she started doing it. Mm -hmm. 
But if you don't have somebody in mainstream get it out there first, then it's not going to happen. Once those things start happening, then local government feels pressure to have to do something to assist. You know, um, there's a guy that I'm friends with on Facebook. You know, he um, he was campaigning for, I think, a girl that went missing in Jersey. Um, and he got a lot of backlash because I think they had to put out in a report that she ran away. So a lot of people was like, you know, you shouldn't have went to the media about this, that they ran away, but they found the girl and he, he, he posted and was like, listen, this was the, the thing that we were trying to do. Find her. We can care how it looks. She's back with her family now. Right, that's that, right. that is the most important thing. So I think you correct me if I'm wrong. You've spoken about somebody, you know, that's creating a solution um, different from the Amber Alert that, that may have been, what can we do as a black community if we're not getting the Amber Alerts, if we're not getting uh, finding our, our children? Some people are not going to like my answer to this. I, I know what I, you're going to say, I, but, but say not, it. They're not going to like my answer but to say this. It. I still think that there's a parental responsibility mm -hmm. in knowing where your child is. Mm -hmm. Um and the other thing, and I'm not, I'm never going to throw stones at victims or families at victims. So I'm not going to use any, any names in this situation. However, having your child be honest about where they're going mm -hmm. helps because mm -hmm. the bottom line is if you say you're going to Lynchburg and you don't come home, where do my search start mm -hmm. in Lynchburg? Lynchburg? If you in fact went to Charlottesville or Richmond and I didn't know, right. we've lost yeah, we ample time looking in Lynchburg. Mm -hmm. So it's important for parents to try to develop a relationship with your child so that your child can be honest with you, especially when they start driving or they're hanging out with their friends or whatever. Because if they're not honest with you, you could be having people search in the area that your child was never in in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So parent respons parental responsibility is huge for me. Um, the second thing is, is having some input and I hate to use the word input, but input in what your child is doing. Mm -hmm. And I know in a lot of communities, there's always been this talk about, you should know if your child is building a bomb in your basement, right? Mm -hmm. And bomb may be exaggerating in some households, but mm -hmm. in some households, that's exactly that's what, what the kids is. were doing. So let's go small scale. You should know if your child owns a, has a gun or not, mm -hmm. right? How many times I search you guys' book bags, mm -hmm. you know? Um, obviously, I think, again, parental responsibility plays a huge part. But, and I know you don't like the term at-risk youth, and so I'm not going to call them at-risk youth, youth, but let's talk about at-risk situations, yeah. right? Where, whether it's the environment, the, environment. Um, the influences, or even the behavior, mm -hmm. right, of these kids puts more responsibility back on the adults mm -hmm. in a neighborhood to assist with that. See something, say something. And people can use the word snitch all they want to. Kiss my ass. Yeah. All right. If you see a child doing something that they should not be doing, you need to say something. If you want to, if that's being labeled as a snitch and you prevent somebody from going missing or dying, be that snitch. Mm -hmm. And I know, again, like I said at the beginning, I know people aren't going to like some of my answers, but this is real. This hits home for me right. because the last thing you want to do is have a child go missing and it's not them finding them. It's them recovering a the body. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. I'll, move the, I'll move the question to you because he talked about, you know, searching book bags, all of those things. And, you know, a lot of kids feel like they have a right to some type of privacy. Mm -hmm. which bathroom. Black, black household, you black household, bathroom, forget privacy. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But technology has changed a little bit to where you can have an app on your phone and you know where your kids is based right. off their phone. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that's an invasion of their privacy or... or or you wanted a person to make sure your daughter has that on her phone so you know exactly where she is if something was like that to happen. Well, it's funny that you asked me that because I was just about to go into that. Um, all My kids and my wife, we share location on our phone. On If you got an iPhone, if you go to find my iPhone, it'll pinpoint exactly where they at. Maybe off a little bit, but it, it'll pinpoint. Um, i give you two examples. When we went to the beach, um, my daughter, your daughter, and our youngest brother was going down to the pool. And I told my daughter, I said, take your phone with you, keep it in your bag. I said, when you get down there, and I learned this from my younger cousin, if you have younger kids, don't have them call you on the phone. Because any anybody, I can stand here and say, call your dad and tell him you all right. FaceTime me. Let me see you. 
Mm-hmm. So when she when they got down there, she she didn't FaceTime. So I looked it up on the iPhone. It told me exactly where she was at. Walked down there. She said she forgot. Mm-hmm. Cool. I understand that. But in in order for us to trust you, you have to give us something to trust you with. Mm-hmm. Now the other day she had tried. She had open gym. And she didn't let us know which, which school it was going to be at, the high school or middle school. So I look at her on the find my iPhone. It, it shows me exactly where she's at, right? So when she get in the car, I said, son, this is how you build trust. If you know you're at, high, at the Liberty High School gym, let somebody know that before they come pick you up. Mm-hmm. Because I'm going to the middle school. I'm going to the high school. By then, somebody could have said, hey, Sonny, I know where your dad is. I'll take you. Yeah. You're gone now. Yeah. And that's why when I speak to people in public that my kids might not know, I let my kids know that they're not my friend. Yeah. I spoke right. to them. I know them from school. So if they say, hey, Sonny, I know your dad come with me, they don't know me. Yeah. So I don't think that's an invasion of privacy. Um, You got to give me something to trust you with. Mm-hmm. And that's, that helps me keep her safe. Not saying that I rely on that, but it helps me keep her safe. Absolutely. Sorry. Absolutely. Um, any closing remarks? Are y'all good? What's, y'all good? Uh, what's your take on that? I like to hear your take on that. On um, what I just asked him? Yeah. Oh, of, of course. I, I'm I'm a hundred percent believer in that because you just you have to because you know I'm not. Well, once you get to a certain age, <laughs> I, I'm old school with that. You know, there is no That's privacy. Right. You know what I'm no saying? Privacy. Because I know what I was doing at the right. at, at right. some of those age time. So. No, so your privacy is in that it, bathroom, and if you fuck that up, you won't have that. If, if you don't <laughs> right. want me, to, if you don't want me to go through your text messages, then you find your own, you pay your bill and you live wherever you want to live at. That's you know right. what I'm saying? But in for your safety, I need to know what's going on. I forget all that privacy stuff. You got your privacy, but I need to know what's going on. I need to know what it is that you're into because I don't want to be surprised if if something happens. That's right. To say, oh, your daughter isn't who you say she is. No, I want to know everything. That's right. Because I want to know, I want to know where you at. I want to know who you with. I want to know wh- who they be with. I want to That's know right. all of that because- Not, not to put y'all on the spot because I, I didn't have daughters. What age does your daughter can have a boyfriend? Uh, I, 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 I got I, I want to, I want to know. That I'm comfortable with? Uh, that you would allow. Allow? 18 for me. Um, and, and even for that is is pushing it because the my problem is my older girl cousins, I still have a problem with, you know, looking at them the way they portray themselves on social media or now they having kids. Like that's still that still rubs me the wrong way. But at the same time, I look at when me and my wife started dating, I was sixteen, she was fifteen. My daughter is about to be twelve. <laughs> yeah. I don't even want to think about it right now. <laughs> I don't either. I don't even want to think about it right now. You cut this part. You can cut this part. <laughs> no, I believe it. I believe it because maybe somebody that's listening might have some advice for me. I I, I don't want to think about that right now. Because because I, I lost a whole family based on this right here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was married. Uh, my ex-wife had three daughters and, and one son. And I wasn't big on them having boyfriends. Mm-hmm. I wasn't big on them dating because... You you know all the negative things that come with that, mm-hmm. and when that and, and and for people who are saying well you, they're gonna get pregnant, I'm not talking about kids, yeah. right? Because I never look at kids as being a problem or being a bad thing. It's gonna challenge. It's gonna be challenges when you decide to have kids early, and of course, it's gonna make decisions for your life that you probably didn't want to make yeah. at the time. Now these kids are gonna make that decision for you about what you can do and how you're gonna be able to do it. But it's the thought process behind. Once you and 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 for those who say, "Well, Jerome, you didn't mention anything about your son's dating," I get that. I understand that it is a difference between boys and girls, and it shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. When boys are dating early, if a girl gets pregnant, the girl's life changes yes. instantly. Right. Mm-hmm. The boy should change too, but it doesn't. It doesn't normally change until the child's here. And I'm not saying that I agree with that. I'm just telling you the facts. For the girl. The minute, even before she finds out she's pregnant, her life has changed. Mm -hmm. So it's more important for that girl to understand the consequences. I want every boy to understand the consequences. Once you once you have sex with a girl unprotected, here's what can happen. Mm -hmm. And you have to be responsible for that. But that responsibility is heightened for that girl. Mm -hmm. And so I've always had I've always wondered about when is the right age. 
I, I, I was thinking 30. I, <laughs> God blessed me with sons because he said, Jerome, yeah. that's never going to work. Yeah. And I don't want to see you in prison for the rest of your life. So he did me a favor. <laughs> so I, I, I was just curious to see how you guys felt about that. Cause yeah, I'm the, still available to go to prison. <laughs> <laughs> the, and the other part, the other part for, um, for, for me and Bake with having girls is they have incredible women in their lives. Uh, my wife with my daughter, you know, I mean, my daughter is basically, you know, I, I get frustrated to the point because it's like, damn, she don't need me no more because she's that independent. And that's all due to to our moms. But, um, you know, same thing with my mom, you know, she's made Sonny independent. She's made Lyric independent. You don't need to. Not that you don't need a man, but it's things you can do for yourself uh, that you don't need. Um, you know, just the just the way my niece know for sure that if she got on something that I think is a little too short, she already know before I say it. She gonna no, Uncle Kwame gonna say something that this might be too short. <laughs> so I mean, they they already know, but um, but yeah, that that trust thing, you know, and it's it's a conversation. I remember when you first had it with me. I was working at Walmart. I told you I got off at 10. It was 10.15. I came out there. You said, look, if you want to ride, be out here at 10 o'clock. You said you got off at 10 o'clock. Absolutely. I probably didn't say it that way, though. No, you did not. <laughs> PG for the podcast. Uh, <laughs> my goodness. Hey, we appreciate y'all for tuning in. We love y'all. Uh, Pete, 